There is a time and a place for showing everything within an image. Unbiased, unvarnished, and absolutely true in so much as possible to what is there. Perhaps you are shooting for a scientific purpose. Or if not, maybe showing everything placed to the aesthetic of the image. But, in astrophotography, as in regular photography, composition can and should, I believe, play a significant role. Composition could be as simple as rotating your camera to align with a wide target so it properly fills your frame. Or it might follow another simple procedure, such as the two-thirds rule, placing your subject of interest one-third to one side of the image. It might follow a somewhat more advanced principle, such as the S-curve principle, though few objects in astrophotography that I can think of are going to conform with that. I've even seen a few fascinating images where portions of the image have been rendered out of focus to convey a sense of depth to the image or attract the eye specifically to a desired subject. And another aesthetic principle that we can often apply to our images is that of balancing light and shadow, or since we're not often dealing with shadows in astrophotography, light and darkness. In regular photography, this is done to convey a sense of depth to the image and to draw the eye toward the desired subject. By and large in astrophotography, balancing light and darkness is going to be less useful for conveying depth, but it can be very useful for drawing the eye toward our subject of interest. The image above portrays the Trifid Nebula on the right and the open star cluster, the Webb's Cross, on the left. Each is about one-third to either side of the frame. In terms of compositional placement, that gives each some interest. And in the deep black of this not yet fully developed frame, they are bright enough each to strongly draw the eye. The Trifid Nebula creates the strongest draw, and while the Webb's Cross is subtle, it's still noticeable. However, the image needs a curves adjustment to bring out the faint detail that is part of the main body of the Turfin Nebula that is just too dim yet to really show up well. The adjustment can easily be done on a curves tool. Unfortunately, since the structure we want is dim, it draws up all the much fainter nebulosity surrounding the Turfin Nebula. The nebulosity itself is not bad, but its brightness is out of proportion with the rest of the image. In other words, it appears brighter than it should be in comparison to our subjects of interest. And even though it is lower in brightness, given how much of the screen that it occupies, it compositionally muddles the image, drawing the eye away from our subjects, especially the web's cross. In fact, with the nebulosity in the background, one might not even notice the web's cross toward the left. But this is a dilemma that is not difficult to resolve. We'll just apply some techniques that we have studied in the past, such as reflection compositing combined with erase masking as well as heavy color and luminosity denoising, constrained by erase masking. And through the judicious use of such techniques, we can compose for light and darkness. And since this image is really underexposed to properly portray that background nebulosity, that's what causes that blotchy, chunky look, we can compensate for that by applying another advanced technique, Gaussian blur constrained by a luminosity range filter. Let's jump right in. The beauty of non-destructive editing is we always have all of our information to work with. Here's the information we started with on our base background layer at the very bottom. This is what the image looks like before we do any additional modification. The first thing I want to do is get some of those brighter star removal artifacts out of there. We can quickly and easily do this on the background layer with our nebula with Affinity Photos in Painting Brush, which intelligently identifies and selectively removes anything that we mark. The cleaned up layer is duplicated and named Triffid, leaving a proof copy of the cleaned up layer should we need it. Then editing layers were added to the Triffid layer so they only affect that layer, beginning with the brightness tool. Brightness is a good tool for evenly bringing up the overall luminosity within a layer. Above brightness, I added a curve layer. Notice a heavy elevation of the low red? That's to bring out fainter detail around the Triffid nebula, but it has the side effect of over enhancing the red of the background nebulosity which is why we have to later on go and suppress it out partly. Along with the red channel, I've also very slightly elevated the lower two thirds of the master channel, bringing up all the lower brightness and color right across the board, but just a touch so that the highest level of luminosity is not over exaggerated. Next up, an unsharp mask is applied for some general and intelligent sharpening of the image. Then I added some clarity, which also has a sharpening effect, but it's a bit contrasty too, and enhances dark versus light edges a bit better. A vibrance and saturation tool was added on the next layer up, and the vibrance slider turned all the way up. This enhances the colors in the dimmer levels of saturation, while guarding them against saturation clipping where detail would be lost. In Affinity Photo, it's a good idea always to remember to work on Vibrance first with a Vibrance tool. 
This is because the vibrant side of the tool guards against saturation clipping. If you can't get your saturation where you want it with the vibrant side of the tool, then you might add to it by moving up the saturation slider. But be careful, there's no protection against saturation clipping, which will cost you in shadow and light detail. Now the reds definitely look good, but the blue is a bit weak. An HSL tool was added to the background layer and tuned to the blue hue, and the brightness of the blue slightly enhanced. It's subtle, but watch the difference when I turn the tool on and off. Now we have some noise in the dark color regions. Noise can show up anywhere, but especially in dark luminosity. If YouTube's video compression doesn't hide it, you should be able to see the noise here. So I added a noise removal tool and cranked the luminance and color sliders all the way up, telling the tool to absolutely dissolve any luminance and color-based noise. Now this will have the undesired effect of softening the entire image, and I want to keep the sharpness of all the structures in the main body of the Trifid Nebula. So with the Denoise tool selected, the Erase Brush is also selected, and passed over the entire body of the Trifid Nebula, erasing the effect of the Denoise tool from the Trifid Nebula. The Trifid Nebula is bright. Bright things tend to have less trouble with noise, so we don't really need this Denoise tool on it. You can see it looks pretty good without the denoising. Dark regions tend to need denoising more, which we can see easily in this image. On the denoise tool layer, to the right of the denoise icon, you can see a mask icon showing where the denoise tool has been painted out of the image. Now we're going to add the reflection composite plate back into the image. You can immediately see the effect. It's much subtler than the last time, leaving the main body of the Turfid Nebula untouched and having a much softer effect on the background luminosity. This is partly because areas where the mask covered especially delicate regions of the background have been partially erased, just a small percentage, which you can see with the paint mask icon beside the rectangle icon, where the markings within the paint mask are fainter, indicating only partial erasure. I've also reduced the opacity of the black reflection composite down to 62%, making it almost half transparent, allowing more of the background to show through. Now, there's just one last thing. I don't like the blotchy look of the red background nebulosity. A big part of the reason for that is this image needs more exposure. If it had more exposure, we'd get a smooth, beautiful background looking like this. Since it doesn't have it, I'm going to smooth that nebulosity out. And I'm going to accomplish that with a Gaussian Blur tool. The Gaussian Blur tool is very powerful, and moving up the slider will quickly and severely blur everything right across the board. But we want to blur things just enough to smooth out the background nebulosity. Setting the tool for 22.1 pixels of blur manages to accomplish the softening effect that I am looking for. Let's take a look. When I click the blur on, you can see the entire image soften up with a smooth blur. The effect is exactly what I want on the background, but I want to retain the sharpness of the Turfid Nebula. Now I could erase out part of the layer over the nebula, but the Gaussian Blur is powerful enough that an artificial boundary would show up if I were to use something as crude as an erase brush to fix this. Fortunately, there is a more sophisticated way to do this. By placing a luminosity range mask tool within the Gaussian Blur layer, I can tell the Gaussian Blur tool only to affect the darker ranges of luminosity and thus it will only affect the dimmer regions outside the main body of the Trifid Nebula. Affinity Photo allows you to place luminosity, hue, and bandpass masks inside of any layer. These masks will selectively allow various hues, ranges of luminosity, or various bands of sharpness to show through. Simply insert the mask within whatever layer you want to affect. Here, in the Gaussian Blur tool, I have reset the luminosity range mask and I want to restrict all passage of the Gaussian Blur below a certain luminosity. Brightness is toward the right, so I drag the curve all the way down and across to the left, restricting the Gaussian Blur to matter that is dimmer than the main body of the Turfid Nebula. And when we add back the stars, it will not affect them nor the Turfid layer, because the star layer is above all the adjustment layers we have just made, independent of all those adjustments, so their appearance and deconvolution remains entirely true. The image is almost where I want it now. The composition clearly draws the eye first to the Turfid Nebula, and second to the much dimmer collection of stars that is the Webb's Cross slightly upper left. There's just one last thing left to do. I'm going to crank down the opacity on the reflection composite plate, allowing a little bit more of the background nebula into the image. I want to have as much of that background nebula as I feel the image will allow, 
without drawing the eye in any meaningful way away from the Turfid Nebula or the Webb's Cross, thus emphasizing the subjects of my composition, much the way an artful photographer would use shadow and light to emphasize the subject of any photograph. And thus, we get our final result. Light and color and shadow in artful balance, yet true to the nature of the stars, nebulae, and open star cluster present in this image especially when you consider that the background nebulae should, in fact, be considerably dimmer than the main body of the Turfid Nebula. The only way that I know to get this kind of power and precision in your developing is through non-destructive, layer-based developing, such as one finds in applications such as Affinity Photo, where you can divide an image out into various layers based on saturation, luminosity, composition, and many other factors, and affect each one of those layers independently. And bear in mind that, so far, we have only gotten into the bare basics of the possibilities. As always, thank you for watching. I know the way that I go about developing astrophotography is quite different from the usual, as I tend to minimize usage of the typical tools and work primarily with layer-based developing. If you have any thoughts, observations, or questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments below. And if you like this video, please take a moment to like and subscribe. That's always appreciated. Now. Get out there and shoot the sky.